Yeah, thanks so much, everyone, for coming um, in person and online to hear about my work. And thanks, Rory, and to everyone here, um, staff as well, for having me. Um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be invited. Um, so, okay, so I'm going to talk through, we, Rory sort of touched on quite a few different projects I've done over the years, but I'm going to specifically talk about three projects um, or performances that use these um, kind of sonic sculptures that you can see in this image and to show you how they have kind of changed or transformed or be re or have been reconsidered over multiple different um, performances and through the different hands of collaborators that I've worked with. Um, so I, I'm just going to sort of show a, a brief overview and then go into each project. Um, so I create my work really, um, I guess, iteratively, which means to make, share, like through workshops, performances, collaborators, um, friends, and then I will kind of gather back what happened and kind of remake those objects or reshape them, I guess. So over time, they kind of become full of all these kind of different hands, marks, um, kind of echoes of what happened before. Um, and it really happens through a lot of experimentation, a lot of risk taking, even on a kind of public stage with um, collaborators, um, audience as well, and workshop participants. I think I've got some different kind of examples. Oh yeah, um, and this is probably my most recent work, um, which kind of shows this sort of progression, one of the kind of core questions of my work, which is um, that I ask as I make it, it's about the work being kind of played upon and then kind of um, moving towards something that's kind of more integrated or kind of reversing those relationships of being played upon or enacting upon something to perhaps it working upon us or even integrating or melding with those objects, sculptures. Um, other questions I might ask as I work are, how do I consider the sculptures themselves? Are they temporary in these kind of mediations that I'm, these situations I'm creating of kind of collaboration and togetherness? Or are they able to kind of transcend that and create these kind of further kind of sonic embodied experiences beyond these kind of immediate interactions? And I don't necessarily know the answer to that, but I just always work by asking these questions um, and over many years, I guess, things start to kind of fall into place. Um, another question I might ask, going back to this image, is how can the sculptures then kind of become entities in their own right in some way? I don't know the answer to that yet, but this project, Respondents, um, has a kind of a deeper collaborative method right from the beginning as the sculptures are prototypes. Um, so I'll talk through some of these in a little bit more detail to hopefully kind of unfold some of those kind of questions as I worked over the years. It's always an interesting process putting together a talk because you're kind of looking back um, and then with new eyes as to what you did before. So um, yeah, actually this was the work that I, I did at Tate's and Ives that um, I met Rory's friend, um, Ben, who was a technician who helped me install this work twice. Once um, as an exhibition piece, it was on exhibition for two, uh, two months, I think, kind of strung, as it were. And then the second time for this kind of performance where we restrung it live. Um, and then the audience have these um, headphones on and they can hear the sound of the gallery mixed with the kind of intimate sounds of working with the structure, basically re-threading it each time. But, um, and just a brief kind of look at sort of like how early kind of sculptures that I've made, the more instrument in form, uh, were kind of developed through workshops. This is an open call public workshop at Chisholm Dance Space, which is in East London. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm going to talk through three works. This is the earliest one. This is Coil of Days, 
uh, from 2017. So I'm going to go right into a clip from this. Um, this is a clip from a 40-minute film. Ah, and before that, <laughs> here's some images from my studio, um, just to give you an insight into the, a little bit of the process before you see the clip. Here we go. With each breath we are condensing the air wheeling this new space into being. I stepped away for a moment, stretched my body backwards, further than I had done before. Possibility growing by increments via echoes between the vertebrae. I still have so many questions, but I feel awake to this call. And when the time comes, I am 100% there. I'm so sorry it's taken so long to get back to you. I've been laying low, researching and feeling sad and not knowing why. Even in the moment of becoming, of wholeness, I'm so acutely aware of everything left behind in the process. The uprooting pain of necessary change, the effort of it. Still for the moment I'm upright. Apologies in advance if this is a touch rambling. It is hot again today. The sun wipes overhead and is blinding gold. Pink flower blossoms thrash at the window, petals loose. Inside, I'm doing everything I can to remain centered. Eyes closed and the perfume of Vu Canvier in my nose. Concentrate on my core, imagining myself a boulder at my middle, immovable and balanced. My thoughts move slowly upward to my ribcage and its captured breath. There I can see a hunk of black rock, jagged from cutting, the exact replica of a heart tossed in a fire and become charcoal.
It is all ember, my emblem of what has passed and what lies ahead. A way of slowly bringing myself back to life, a self-resuscitation. So in Coil of Days, a series of collaborations unfold around eight sonic sculptures or instruments. In the performance and film, we unfurl the sonic spaces of these, playing and working them as our shared tools. And in the first scene, which you saw a little bit of, chapter one, bated breath, we introduce the realm of openings. And in chapter two, communal breath, our playing of the aqueous spine vertebrate creates liquid sounds that connect us. And the blue kind of uh, shapes are, um, wavering shapes are later, um, the kind of uh, macro footage of, of strings vibrating in later objects. And they kind of connect the performers across the space, which is something the film enables um, uh, uh, to investigate a little bit further. Um, and breath condensation transforms slightly the kind of sound and pitch of the flutes in this instrument where there are two people connected, which you'll see in the next clip. And the tone was supposed to be um, actually adjusted by the opening and closing of doors in the instrument's body. But when I came to the performance space, all the kind of sensitive sort of settings that I'd created in my studio shifted. So this became a kind of a playing of this kind of feedback door in the room. And then in chapter three, you'll see clips coming up. It's called An Evolutionary Remnant we propagate and root ourselves in this newly established landscape that we've been investigating with these objects. And in chapter six, the thinking reads, we play these manifold reeded pipes to sample and filter the air, moving as one multi-limbed being. And chapter seven, trefoil, we have a triangular instrument with tremolo arms that creates kind of geometric shapes and pitch shifting sounds that play out in our kind of negotiations and the elastic is, can be quite, um, what's the word? Um, it, it's the way it's kind of threaded, uh, the performers have to kind of hold this as well in, in our bodies quite tightly. <laughs> and the last chapter, uh, the instinctive unfolding, we tessellate our bodies around this kind of metal diamond structure that you can see in the background. I'm just gonna play another clip. Here we go, it continues from where we left off. I will be with you again soon. When I felt the pulse, my body relaxed, released itself from the coil of days. So much has happened this week. I can't keep up with myself. It's important to cut yourself some slack, and I hate to say it, but time will help. Maybe if the moon passes through its various phases at least once, everything will feel different. Who knows? This feeling, the effort you mention, is always about the moon, it seems. Whenever my back hurts or I drop a cup or lose my words, it's the moon, people tell me. Hand in hand with its changing phases goes our continued work of understanding. From disappearance to emergence, from a jaw aching to form words to the wide arc of a knowing grin. 
we're moving forward by increments, and a time-lapse record of our progress is captured in rivers as they pass. We just need some perspective, to get high enough to be able to see its totality rather than always being so close, so low to the ground. If I could live in the mountains most of the time, I would. Anyway, the point is that we must establish ourselves in the landscape. Propagating, rooting, grafting, turning one thing into many. Yesterday, as I was working, I had the sensation of six or maybe eight hands moving rhythmically at once, as if you'd multiplied me. A ghostly threading of your own arms undermined from behind to make me multi-limbed. I turned around instinctively to view my reflection, to try to understand what was happening, but there was no one there. I could still feel those limbs, though. This reminded me of another ritual from the deep past, where reflections meant understandings. Old, forgotten stories of selfhood, early failures. I thought, too, of the poem about Echo, our Echo, and of the boy with his six-pack and haircut staring into the water, asking himself, are those really my eyes? He'd get laughed out of the room if he were here now, so that's something. So um, in response to each of the sculptures, I worked with a writer called Amy Leigh Pettifer. Um, and the writing that uh, we created was edited back around the kind of shape of the sound and the way of, that the objects were played. Um, uh, so for example, the triangle object uh, sculpture, um, the the words were kind of created in, in a kind of triangular format and then they're edited in and around the sounds as a kind of extra sort of layer and more kind of exploration of what each of these sculptures is and could be. Um, and in the live performance, there's no um, narration. It's just the objects. So there's, um, there's kind of different... I like to kind of create sort of multiple possibilities um, around how these objects or sculptures can be kind of presented or seen. Um, so I kind of have a little bit of a description of something we've already seen here, but I'll read it out. Um, so um, the kind of narrative around the, the, this kind of dark metallic um, sculpture um, it kind of speaks of those sort of past scuffs and caresses that are kind of on this sort of spherical surface of this object. And also in this film on the floor of the performance space um, from like many other performances from previous people in the room. Um, so we kind of hear the scuffs first. We see them also in shadow. The object is kind of hard to make out. It starts quite darkly, dark, sorry. And then it appears kind of heavy and metallic. It's actually made of ceramic. Um, and a performer, the performer Priya, um, works close to the ground, using their hands to search across its surface ruptures to just find a place to kind of try and grip it so that they can kind of lift it out into this kind of shared space that we're working in. They kind of introduce it to us slowly and then breathe into the centre of it. Um, and at the moment, that kind of hollowness becomes full in one way. And then in another moment, when, she, uh, when they tip the, the sculpture, there's a kind of jangling object inside it, which rolls across this kind of um, rough surface on the interior as well. And it suddenly becomes, I think, kind of charred and brittle, these kind of fragments falling inside. Um, and what that is is actually a broken clippy mic. So you know the little clips you put onto your lapel, this kind of plastic thing. Um, it got stuck inside the sculpture. Um, and I was doing a workshop with families um, years before using this object in a, very, in a much kind of earlier iteration and somebody pulled the, the, um, the microphone cord. So it broke off and it was stuck inside. But actually then that kind of became part of the sort of expression of the sculpture going forward. Um, 
So just going to play another clip from this. So this shows more um, performers working around one object. Time passes so quickly like this with heavy beating wings. Why don't you come next time, all of you, and join me? I think you know the way, but call if you get lost. Early morning, several shocks to the system. First up, and picking my way carefully across the floor, littered with still sleeping bodies, limbs entwined. Limbs entwined. Limbs entwined. A body lifted and gently put back. Precipitous visions. Early, Early morning. morning. Early morning. Early morning. I think you should be gentler. Mm. I think you should be gentler. I think you should be gentler. I think you should be gentler. There's work to do. There's work to do. Face to face with the rock face, thick set and not a friend to drowsiness, to queasiness, but at work, possible to an alarm or potentially a siren or push through, just a test, just a test. It got complicated. What if I ask you to carry it for a while? Would that be any good? 
You have no idea how much. to be testing the water for such difficult things. And then the toll taking. And the over. And the dreaming about it afterwards. Under, over. All of it. Over, under. Under, over. Early morning. Right over the left, over. Without choking it. From the inside to the outside to the real world and back. From the inside to the outside to the real world and back. Over, under. Over, under. Under, under, over. over. That it might be potentially under, over. Something to do with our glory? working ends with their tortoise shell and silver bells. Like losing a limb or growing a limb. Like losing a limb or growing a limb. Like finding a limb? I'm going now with a limb. Early morning. Yeah, so I think there's kind of a presence of a crowd, in a way, within each um, sculpture. And um, especially when the sculptures are played by multiple people at one time, um, one gesture can kind of become echoed by many, kind of affirming it in return, or sometimes even the opposite, kind of cancelled out, and then you're sort of like trying again somehow. So um, always my kind of process um, is or in the past has been to many, many kind of weeks and months creating these um, kind of structures, in this case, in the studio, and then inviting uh, collaborators and performers to come in and work with me um, from all kind of different type of practitioners at first, um, not just movement practitioners. And, um, and then we work slowly. Basically, we'll have one sculpture uh, between us and we'll share and observe each other um, working with it, um, or being with it, I think is probably a more accurate way to describe how they're um, performed, is a kind of being with the, the object and kind of meeting it as well. And we'll share um, in that process like ideas just by kind of, you know, like a kinesthetic thing. You see um, someone doing one thing with the, with the sculpture and then that kind of gains ground, it kind of accumulates. And so something very specific happens with that specific group around that object for the, the 
performance that's coming along, you know, two weeks later. So for this, we had two weeks, which was quite um, a, a glorious amount of time. Um, this was through a project grant, so I could sort of say how long we, we needed with the objects. But um, later on with projects which were had much kind of tighter budgets and institutions, uh, we had much less time. Um, so it's, I'm always thinking about that, kind of how I want to kind of negotiate how these, how these performances happen and what's the most important thing, the process leading up to it or the moment. Um, and then that's better for the kind of audience, the moment where the audience enters this space that we have created. Um, so um, I think just a few more images from some of the different chapters of this. And I'm going to move on to a piece which, again, where these um, sculptures kind of came back into the work again for tuning in a vacuum, which was at Towner Gallery um, in 2022. So just after lockdown, um, I think. Um, and this was a 40 minute live performance with seven of the sculptures. Um, and in that moment, I was kind of thinking around, um, I guess, the object, they're becoming almost like choreographic um, tools that sort of organize space as well, and it's stages in themselves, each object kind of a different stage or form of stage. Um, and I think each one's kind of almost serves as a sort of a door, a different way to access this kind of space of collective inquiry that I'm kind of investigating with each one. And I think that when they work, the, the sculptures tend to kind of almost speak back um, through the sounds as well that accumulated. And the, the sounds really kind of give the performers something back to then kind of think what next. Um, it's challenging to perform these live because they always bring something new so you could um, improvise and improvise and perform and perform. The same for me in my studio beforehand and when I bring them to the space, new things kind of happen and same for when we're performing them. Um, it will change in a way each time. But there are kind of anchor points and I think those anchor points are what we kind of use to sort of agree, like now, now we've arrived here, so now we'll see how we get to B that we planned, we've arrived at A, well, well, how do we get to B, you know? So it's a kind of a always alive kind of thinking process. Uh, this is an image from my studio just before tuning in a vacuum where I prepared all of these um, different um, sculptures. Um, in this piece, I didn't use these uh, reel to reel. You'll see that in the next piece. So the top left, there's an image of these reel-to-reel -reel sculptures I've been building. They were my collaborators during lockdown, um, but I wasn't quite ready to show those here. I'm gonna show you this really rough video from my studio to show you the kind of detailed level of material experimentation that I get up to. So I tried, um, so I've kind of created this form, which is this um, brass loop that has a kind of a bounce, a lovely sort of bounce to it. I'm not aware yet of how it's going to be performed, but I'm trying out all these different um, kind of uh, balls on it. Um, I think this is a polystyrene ball, but I try every single material that I can possibly get my hands on, and I'll play it for hours to kind of discover something about the object. Yeah. And then for this piece, we had, um, I think, four days together in the space, having never worked together. Um, so this was in Town of Eastbourne in their kind of new big um, kind of performance space they've opened downstairs. Oh, there's, this is actually a video. So 
So yeah, and the, the, earlier in the week, we were just gathering around each sculpture and trying out stuff. So we didn't know how the kind of performance was going to land exactly. But this is like, again, like a hollow kind of ceramic piece and it has um, kind of latex, um, sort of like these membranes on it. And um, uh, it does multiple different things, but I, I've been pulling kind of knotted threads through them um, so that in the end, uh, performers were either end of the thread and that kind of created certain rhythms depending on the speed they pull the threads through. And um, then they're kind of negotiating the space around the sculpture with this kind of um, uh, rhythmic um, relationship in mind. Um, I think I have a, so that was the actual performance. Um, just also to mention these screens here, the room was very, very long. The audience are kind of where you can, where you can see where you're sitting, pointing to the back of the room and a little bit round the side. Um, and, oh yeah, everything is amplified. I not everything actually. Um, they're amplified in very different ways. Um, the speakers are just either side actually and in the inside the audience as well but these screens are um i ended up calling them sound sails um they they gradually moved back through the performance to kind of reveal other sculptures and objects and also to kind of change the the sort of resonance scale of the space i guess um and previous to that i'd been on residency at the bauhaus foundation and they have this restored stage, which is incredible. Um, so it's this kind of black box stage, um, a cube. And at the back of the stage, these doors open to the student canteen. So you're kind of looking right through this illusory space into a kind of communal space where, where students are kind of, would have eaten actually vegetarian meals together in the 1920s. Um, so anyway, I was just inspired by that, this kind of idea of the opening of space. So um, the floor panels are also actually, um, um, I think they're called like acoustical floor panels um, as well. Um, oh, it's a video.
Um, so some of the, uh, so actually early on, I did quite a lot of research into um, instruments um, and um, to, to kind of create these sort of early forms of some of these sculptures. Um, and when I was making this piece, I discovered that whether this is true or not, I don't know, but there was a, something called the Sussex Trumpet, um, that because town, town is based in East Sussex, and kind of I found out that these trumpets were often discarded as pairs found down wells, kind of suggesting their use in ritual, and so I became really interested in the idea of kind of duos or kind of um, uh, two similar sounds kind of playing off one another and unfolding and evolving over time, um, and this kind of um, kind of exponentially grew from duos into kind of trios and then quant uh, quintets. And so throughout this whole piece, there are all these different kind of relationships. So that was a very kind of intimate sound as well, obviously amplified from inside the object. Um, and then it kind of opens out in the space to pieces that um, uh, use the entire space without any um, kind of amplification. That's actually a, a kind of a pipe reeded pipe piece that I then play through water in this kind of triangu triangular dish at the bottom. Um, that was like a vacuum loop. It's a metal loop. It doesn't, uh, it's not amplified at all. Um, just a few more images of the screens kind of moving back. Here we go.
Yeah, we'll come back to this um, sculpture in an, in another performance. But um, I found something in my notes actually to mention. Um, might be going back a bit to some of the kind of studio images, but invention is definitely an integral part of the creative process for me. So it's improvisation, and a kind of a gap or a question appears, in which I want to find a way to kind of bridge through trying things out. And I'd say tinkering there's a lot of tinkering that happens and at first it kind of, it can be awkward and sometimes that comes out in the performance as well um but it's about looking at something from all angles and kind of um creating i guess this new ish thing in the process and i think the sculptures are, for me anyway are bridges from one question to the next and to kind of keep these questions flowing the momentum of the practice is to kind of keep an openness in them so that they never quite settle. Um, so, yeah, this actually ended in a kind of a cacophony. Um, and some of the, I think in the initially, my kind of curiosity was about building these sculptures to be able to kind of hear what it sounds like when people focus on a kind of a task together or being in or out of connection or empathy and what those kind of polyrhythms that that might kind of create, that sort of group dynamic. Um, so that was the organ of organs and the little uh, drum piece with a kind of latex, that's called um, uh, the multi-headed hydra. Um, so also these things have to be kind of built so that they, they're delicate and they're open, but they also have to kind of almost not collapse during playing. So also it's kind of a, trying to find a balance of certainty and uncertainty of kind of function, but then a feeling of, um, but embracing that kind of feeling of emergence. And um, so what I love about working this way is it, it takes me into this kind of very fluid world, but then I have to keep stepping out again and going, okay, how is this actually going to, to function and work? And how am I going to build that? So each kind of, I think sculpture then becomes its own world through all those different sort of thought processes. Um, I guess others have said they might have a science fictional appearance, but um, I'm not sure. <laughs> so... During lockdown, I was collaborating with these, uh, I guess, reel-to-reel -reel, um, machines in my studio. Um, and I created these um, kind of hanging structures that the the reel-to-reel -reel thread would go through. And for the longest time, I didn't know what actual sounds to put onto the um, the reel-to-reel -reel itself. So I was just experimenting with the way I initially actually recorded those um, flutes that you just heard onto the uh, reel to reel, and um, it it was um, yeah it was a kind of it was very um, repetitive obviously to listen to. So I sort of left these for a little while. I quite liked the kind of mechanics of them, the way they sort of moved um, and vibrate in in the space. Um, so I sort of completed that sort of element of it and then left it. And then I was asked to do audiographed festival, and I thought this would be a challenge to bring together, of course, the um, sculptures I've been making with these um, reel-to-reel -reel pieces, and to start recording them onto the onto these kind of uh, tape loops, and to see what would happen when they were played back on top to make an even more kind of complex sort of ecology. I think I always wanted to kind of overlap 
the sculptures and to investigate the kind of textural sounds together as they're um, working, yeah, to kind of create something more kind of um, in-depth or surprising as well. I'm kind of looking for surprises when I work. Uh, so I'm... This was in the lead up to Audiograph Festival. I got all of the sculptures out that I wanted to work with and I played them for weeks beforehand on my own in the studio space. And I tried out recording them onto these different reel-to-reel -reel, uh, players. Um, and the reel-to-reel -reel players are, have got their own characters, personalities, they're, they're old. Some of them work really well and some of them do completely their own thing. So I've in incorporated that into the um, sculpture um, itself and into the kind of composition, as it were. These are just kind of a little, some um, in progress recording clips from my studio to show you um, what I did before I took these objects to Audiograph Festival. So here's one. <laughs> cacophony actually um so i did uh they all played together at the beginning of the performance and then they kind of separate out and each one has its own kind of movement character um which you'll see in the later videos i think this video is similar but um the what you can hear onto the reel to reel uh is this uh, sort of green sculpture with these um polystyrene balls that are kind of hitting these like elasticated um tuning forks um and then as they're playing the um the feedback from the the hanging sculptural piece is then wobbling the um, tape reel as it's going through. Um, so the magnetic pickup is kind of making contact and then not, and then and so on, um, in different kind of rhythmic ways. So it's kind of shifting what the kind of live play into this uh, uh, other kind of layers as they're processed by the machines and the sculptures. Um, oh yeah, it's gonna play. You don't actually see the top of the sculptures in here, but they're, they're hung from kind of suspension <clears throat> threads across the top of this uh, studio. And then uh, this was um, um, a performance in an a amazing warehouse in um, the center of Oxford, actually, called Avada. It's a community uh, studio space, and they also put on kind of workshops and events and performances in this amazing um, space which has got so many different surfaces and materials on it um, so it was real joy to to perform in there and the, the roof is very high but it's also kind of apexed so the sound in there is really interesting you you feel like any sound image on the other side of the space is right happening right next to you 
um, which was really lovely. There was no actual kind of, um, I guess, resonance in the space. So um, again, we kind of use these sculptures as tools to understand and interact with the space. Um, and then kind of, um, there were five of, I think there were five of us performers and um, we kind of um, sought over um, three days to kind of blur the sort of boundaries between our different practices and bring ourselves together into this kind of mode again of collective inquiry. Um, so I brought the real to real sculptures to this space as well. That's from there. So here's a clip from that. I'm sorry about that. I thought the clip would have been a bit longer. I'm actually, um, I'm going to go right to the next clip. Here we go.
Okay, and we just have um, a little amount of time for just the last clip of this um, performance. And then I'll end after this. Okay, that's the end of my talk. Thank you so much for listening. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs>
I, don't, I, I was picking up on all these like sort of references to everydayness, but also you mentioned that people have commented on it, referring to things like sci-fi before, which I, I, c I can kind of understand. Like sometimes watching the things blob around sort of reminds me of Studio Ghibli and stuff. It was like <laughs> I guess that's it. But I guess I wanted to know if this was if this is like an intentional thing or if this is just something I'm seeing. This kind of yeah, like sort of relationships to everyday things and the way people were moving and stuff. Yeah, totally. I think it's like always because they go into this kind of really, I think, quite abstract space that w I, I notice that when audience come in, they're like, you know, oh, what, what's this? We've, we've kind of created this bubble. But I think that the those like everyday tasks and it brings it back and it's always kind of bringing it back to something very familiar that we do and actually earlier works um i made this piece that was you know maybe lots of people have done this but um amplified knitting needles or i was very i'm very interested in the kind of i'm a maker um and i'm i equate that process and rhythm of making to the shape of the object to the sound that it then goes on to make and i think that communicates through the the object itself to the people performing it um yeah, we could do a kind of a big grand dance, but I think it's also like always bringing it back. The object kind of almost grounds us, so the task is grounding as well. And I do use sewing rings actually in a lot of the work. Um, and that kind of task of sewing and pulling through and threading and the different kind of rhythms of that really fascinate me. I suppose maybe this has nothing to do with it, but my mum is a really prolific knitter of really complex incredible like you know um feral jumpers and things and she falls asleep and she's still knitting because the kind of action is in her body and i think when we're when i first meet performers and we kind of gather around these objects that process has to sort of take place where it becomes almost second nature like we kind of revisit them again and again until it feels like home in a way with the with the task or the action we're doing. Yeah, oh, oh, that's that's cool to hear. Yeah, because you can it, it translates really well, like the task and the action based thing as well. Like something I noticed in one of the videos of the performances that at one point the performers move microphones into place, and you know, like they're moving panels around. It's like the performance isn't just about the sculptures that you've made. It's about sort of everything happening in the space and and that kind of I find that sort of like task based stuff really interesting um, mm. and almost like I, I guess f for me like a relationship to work like moving mm. microphones is something I associate with work but also can be like a, a very con is a very considered action um, which yeah I don't like because you're a technician as well uh, yeah. uh, like <laughs> do you feel like that comes into your into your work at all this you know sort of like working as an art technician and installing works and then going to make your own works do you feel like these things are connected at all or yeah absolutely well it's like a also as an artist you have um, you're lucky to have a commission or a thing and then in between you, you work and I find that my work which is often somehow repetitive it's in like a warehouse or I'm doing like um, also visitor services or selling things or whatever um, that that kind of I think I've lot, slightly lost my train of thought but that sort of the technician work actually came slightly later and I noticed that when we're moving objects together I'm absolutely fascinated by this. I'm really focused in this moment that we have to kind of consider the weight and the shape of the object. And then we have to kind of communicate before we move it or hang it. Or um, I just find, yeah, I find that really engaging about that work. Um, and it's, yeah, it, it kind of happened the other way around though. I become a technician more recently. Um, but yeah, I find it really touching those moments actually where we move the objects for each other or we lift them or we pack them away or we bring the microphones out. That's part of the performance as much as the 
as the um, it's kind of care for and caring for that space and being sensitive to it in each other and the things and yeah yeah there's like a quite a deep sensitivity to how everyone performing is moving things and and I was kind of interested as well as like when when this kind of association for me with pedestrian movement came up I was wondering if the performers are always like trained professional performers or whether it's you know people you know or like someone that might be referred to as amateur and like mm. yeah because like working with material in this way really it sort of like leads you into being quite sensitive with objects and material mm. yeah it's, it's interesting to see yeah whoever i work with it all be, it, everyone kind of enters on a kind of horizontal plane in a way because the ob it's the object that sort of the sculpture that enables certain relationships to play out but i've tried i've actually i'm really still figuring out who i work with and why obviously i deliver lots of workshops with people of all ages and different kind of situations circumstances and that's really fed into my uh kind of method of performing um but the first piece, Coil of Days, was a mixture of like, I guess, somatic, which means like really uh, embody people that are very kind of used to working with their body, um, um, kind of performers and amateur like performers. That's a terrible word, but I, I mean, just people kind of really interested and it's they're together in the space. And then I became very aware of the pressure of that when you come to perform live as well. I think there's a lot of pressure on a performer so I was thinking, how can that kind of be supported? Or does the sculpture take that away a bit so we can enter this space together? Um, can it, I mean, can it hold some of that weight of the risk and the challenge? Um, and Towner was a mixture. And audiographed was the first time I worked with people really from, a, would say, like a sound performance background. And uh, we put this together really quickly. Um, and it was very satisfying. I mean, it's kind of like I, I guess it depends on the who I'm working with, the kind of time scale I need. But I don't mind. Like if I have two weeks, I could happily work with with anyone. And there's a real joy in that process. And we support each other as well in that. So. Yeah, I, I guess that's what's cool about action based stuff, is it? Like you say, it sort of like flattens things a bit and. And then, like, let's everyone work up together. Yeah, yeah. like, we start in... It, we're all starting from zero. Yeah. And then you kind of... I, I think what happens along the way is I... We all... Actually, we collectively kind of make decisions about who's drawn to which sculpture and why. Um, it, I mean, not verbally why, but it, yeah. it becomes apparent. Um, but in the beginning, there's all the kind of options and possibilities. So... Great, cool. I've got some more, but I will I will pass it on to some other people if if they want, and then we can come back to to me later. Has anyone got any questions? Yeah. Um, it was really fascinating to see all your work, kind of fresh sculptures that I haven't really seen anywhere else. Um, and I'm curious what the inspiration was behind the tape sculptures mm -hmm. and also if you like conceived them as kinetic sculptures or if you think of them now as being kinetic sculptures or you think of the rest of your art in that context also mm. yeah they they represented a kind of real shift in the way i was working um so i was thinking about the tape as the potential of threading it through things in the way that i'm threading through um, I get elastics and different kinds of strings um, and amplifying them and then this kind of idea of thinking about the thread uh, sorry the reel as a as a as a thread and this kind of there's always a recall in the material as well and it came about actually because I had a conversation with um, uh, a friend of mine who's a sound artist who works actually a lot with sensors she's called uh, Nicola Woodham um, really love her work and um she uh said why don't you try working with 
with reel to reel because it's physical. It has a physicality like the rest of your sculptures. So um, I kind of embarked upon that during lockdown. It was kind of the perfect collaborator during that time. Um, and kinetic, um, I think that's something I'm considering at the moment and thinking about um, going forward. But um, I can't seem to categorize my work. So if I kind of call it kinetic, it will probably then become something else. Um, but I do, I do wonder what might happen if those reel-to-reels are integrated even more into the sculptures over time. And perhaps that kind of presents a different sort of format, like a, a longer form sort of performance that people can enter. Um, yeah, it's all about time, isn't it? Different kind of time and space. Um, and what a different presentation could afford in that sense, how it might all shift. Thanks. Cool, yeah, thank you. I think I agree, like, it's not really just to put the label kinetic on the work, but mm. it seems like movement is kind of vital to a lot of it. So, yeah, yeah especially free movement. So it's yeah, really cool. thank you. And also, I wonder if, I, I don't know if it's connected, it must be, but the word kinesthetic is like learning by looking something moving and happening, and then you pick up on that and you kind of embody it, and then you can do it. And it's like, um, without going into too much sort of theory or anything, um, I read, read a lot of kind of Tim Ingold's work about tools and making, and how people learn from generations um, how to create a net or a rope or a tool that kind of works on those um, creates those things and you learn by looking and then there's a whole kind of process and that's really interesting work cool thank you hey hi um thank you for hey. sharing i really fell into the fluid world by watching these performances. And I think at the beginning I was um, having a lot of questions and then I sort of fell out of that reason and it was quite magic to, to watch. Um, so I'm gonna try find a question. Thank um, you. <laughs> and I was gonna ask about science fiction and then you, you mentioned it. I was thinking about Ursula Le Guin's uh, Hainish Mm. series. I don't know if you've read some of those novels, but um, in that universe, uh, humans are an intergalactic sort of semi, um, or quite spectral civilization. And there's a, the kind of, the way they're organized is through this esoteric um, politics that's not necessarily, they're, they're sort of like, they seem to be quite, um, mystic rather than mm. rational in their ways of understanding or, or in their ways of organizing. Mm. Um, and yeah, I felt like these sculptures to me were a sort of ex experimenting in, in organizing. Mm. Um, so along with the experience of everyday objects is also like maybe a world building of mm. imagining um, other methods in which we could organize. I don't know if you can respond to that. Um, it's not necessarily a question, but yeah. Yeah, and I'm, wow, thank you so much again. Another amazing comment and um, wow. Um, I have read Ursula Gwyn and um, so I'm so super pleased to hear you pick up on that. Um, yeah, I, I guess, I think that those kind of yeah those ways of organizing are are rational but they're also yeah they're probably kind of a different no hang on I need to think about this <laughs> it's a different it's a kind of a different um way in so we're trying to be sort of working with space that already exists and then bringing these kind of shapes we could call them, or we could call them tools or ritual objects, if you want, another time. Um, and then we're using them to kind of look at what's there, lay foundations, root, and then um, see what kind of arises from that. And then that becoming the new 
logic, I guess. Um, and it's really different with each um, collective and with each space, so it's sensitive. And um, it's not like imposing a structure on a space, like this goes here because this does this. It's kind of from bottom up finding out before we then um, uh, make any decisions in a way. Um, yeah, I think that openness leads to those like really um, big possibilities. Perhaps that's what it's touching on. Cool, thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, I guess to follow in a more concrete question, the the symbols and colors and forms that make that create a sort a sort of loose aesthetic around mm -hmm. your work and your sculptures. Um, do you feel inspired by particular um, cultural traditions or cultural artifacts, or mm -hmm. it does it feel more um, like an intuitive process when you're deciding these mm -hmm. factors to create these mediums of uh, play and I think that intuitive um, so yeah the intuitive process is always informed by things that inevitably I have seen or encountered or or, or researched or read so there are probably kind of multiple cultural um, um, factors involved especially when it comes to sort of instruments like the reed instrument um, it's in bagpipes I think they're called halusi pipes like a kind of from Asia flutes from from that part of the world and they kind of pop up all over the world in in different kind of slightly different forms and um, so anytime I'm kind of using one of these kind of mat materials like a reed or I make my own reeds as well um, I am bringing up all of those histories and kind of their connecting them and when we play them it's almost like and I guess we might be evoking some of these kind of possible connections um, yeah absolutely cool um, if I can ask one more tiny question the research that you are mentioning um, mm. do you feel like you want to um, avoid presenting that in, in the way research is often presented um, mm. in, a, in a very linguistic way. Um, and yeah, because I, I, as you said, trying not to get too much into theory, um, but maybe that that's in a, a part of your like creative mm. process. Mm. Um, and do you feel like you want to avoid the pitfalls of kind of over mm. uh, making it sound really, I don't know, like, yeah, a lot of language, I guess. Well, I think, yeah. First, yeah, like, written and spoken language, I do write and um, I do, and I read a lot, and I do obviously think through these things. But the words really, um, are, I guess that's why I make these um, sculptures, because these things are kind of filtered through um, the work. And then when it comes to sort of, yeah, presenting my work and talking about my work, that then comes full circle. And I find that all these things kind of hopefully like re-emerge and that takes the conversation um, and the depth of it forward. So then I'll be kind of, oh, now I'll, I'll look into this kind of research and, and think about this thing. But yeah, I'd say it's very much informed by my um, readings as well. And I suppose I don't want to... I said that kind of comment because I felt like... Um, yeah, again, uh, I guess these things kind of emerge through through the work. I find they come full circle. They, they do come back and kind of um, make themselves present again. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else want to ask a question? I'll take over for a bit and then if anyone pops up. Or is there one at the back? No? Okay. Um, I'm going to ask quite a practical question <laughs> um, because everyone in here is a student and some of mm. them will be leaving soon. Um, your documentation is excellent. 
Thank you. <laughs> uh, both like visually and sonically. And I guess I wanted to ask you for you what the value of that mm. documentation is. Because I know when I when I was at I was at Tate St. Ives when your work was there. Mm. And there was the video playing, which oh, was yeah. one of the, is it the same it was the same video you played? Yeah, from the beginning, Call yeah. of the Days. And it's it's kind of nice that you've you know there's been this this work done and then it's been documented and then you're able to show it as a piece and also show it mm. in this setting and it it seems to me like the the value of that documentation is very high and I wondered if what what it meant to you to document the performances yeah absolutely and I've been through all different phase um, phases of my um work thinking should i document things should i not how should i be going about this it's um but i think um to be able to to look and listen back it's different it's not the same as being there and being in that but i'm able to again kind of have a different view in it and i'm able to share it more widely um than the 100 people or 10 people that came to a particular performance and some of my documentation I find really kind of problematic and I don't want to replay it but these um so I do have people that I work with who I've kind of met um like a videographer who just sort of understands my work and so we kind of have a, a relationship um there um and then also I've got quite good at um how to kind of record the room as well and to kind of listen back and try to sort of let things sort of um settle back quite quickly after the performance how I thought they were but it's it's never the same and you're missing the kind of spatial aspect as well which is really important in the work but um this is super useful and it's obviously great to be able to kind of reshare it we wouldn't be having this conversation in this way without it and Coil of Days is a film for film's sake. It was filmed in that way. Whereas this this piece um, is a documentation of a performance and that's different as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's, I, I don't know, again, a bit of a technician point, but it's yeah. it's quite nice to see the technology in the work as well. Like, quite often I feel like in gallery contexts and things, there's a there's an attempt to like hide technology yeah. often, and it always I, I always feel a bit uncomfortable about it. So it's it's quite cool in all these videos to see it see it there and see it not only just there and forgotten about, but there and being considered and being used like anything else. And yeah, yeah. I, f I find that really. It's what's necessary, isn't it? And it shows how all of these all the wires and everything, you know, how everything is kind of connected or. Uh, wired up and brought together and I just think it's a really important part of how you're feeling the the space when you when you enter it as well it's not kind of yeah no, I I guess we only taped these up so people didn't trip on them <laughs> it's, it sort of like reframes uh, the context a lot of things are put in in performances say in like musical performances you know like mm. there's often tech and performer and worker are all in like mm. these different places and it, it feels like it's really sort of pulled apart here which is very cool very cool um you've sort of like done all my questions before i've asked them there was one really amazing thing you said that i just kind of wanted to bring up again which was about objects organizing space mm which I don't really have a question about, but I just thought it was a really cool um, <laughs> thing to say. And then I was, I was going to ask about material, like, because it feels very material-led. Mm. And this is like a conversation that me and Eka have had, talking about work that's material-led and concept-led. And you talked about your mother being a prolific knitter. Mm. And did I read somewhere that your dad was also a wood 
worker? Did I? Oh yeah, imagine? he's a he's a tool maker. Tool maker. Yeah, so it's a family. We're a family of makers. makers. Yeah. So like the material seems very important, and like yeah. again, you talked about you sort of talked about the materials a lot in the talk. You know, the the acoustic mm. paneling upright and on the floor. Um, yeah, I don't know mm. if if you want to elaborate on the materials a little bit because you hear the materials a lot as well though because it's you really they're sounding a lot like the ribbon i don't know if it's ribbon on the mm. string sort of bowing the string oh it's latex so, latex yeah 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 like you can you can hear all of these materials and it's mm. is that just something that is is always been there so it just feels completely natural or do you think about the materials before you pick them Oh, it's both because it's like accumulated knowledge, I think. And um, but I, I have, I, I think in my studio, I have a kind of collections of materials that I look after, and I have them all in kind of boxes. And then when I bring things out, they sort of cross, cross over into. I feel, oh, this would be good for this, and then it turns out it wasn't. But then I might get it out and then go, wow, that made this, this latex. Uh, string made this bowing sound and I originally thought I would be doing some kind of woven elasticated thing with it um, and it's just so simple in the end um, but it will be from trial and error of lots and lots of different materials um, that I'm working with and I guess then because one might be intended for one or sculpture and then become part of another that kind of connects all the objects as well um, so they're quite, I guess they're quite diverse in form and material and function. So those sort of things connect them across across space. Um, and yeah, I think with the material also, it's about always kind of going in and then coming back out again. It's, it's like the same we were talking about, kind of rooting in every day again. It's like going really into detail. Um, what does, you know the polystyrene ball or the the hollow plastic ball or the and the way that it touches the surface of this particular thing that I've made um you know they're that's quite practical isn't it um but over time that's it stops being that way they kind of become their own sort of entities with these things belong to them like they always have <laughs> I guess it must really inform like the in in the same way the the sound and the shape of the sculptures must inform each other a lot. You know, it's like if you mm. come across a sound that you like and you try and fit it into a sculpture, I'm assuming, or like you create a shape mm. and then it makes a sound that you like and you can grow off that. It happens all different ways. There's yeah. no kind of one avenue, I'd say. Um, yeah, sometimes the sound comes first, sometimes the the sculpture comes first but often it will change everything so then it produces something something else i'm not i wouldn't say i'm precise in at all in thinking this is um an exact sound that i want to make i think that would probably close down the sculptures and their potential uh, for me anyway in another practice that might be might be different um and then that i'll take that further so then it will become and then I guess I'm learning, aren't I, about the, the sculptures that are finding me, I suppose. And then I'm able to maybe make them more specifically in the future, I don't know. But it feels like a continual learning. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think you can see that in the, in the sculptures as well, because there's not really a uniformity to the way that they look or the shapes that they use. So mm. you can tell that they've been formed through, like, experiencing the materials and the objects themselves and they've changed because I, I think yeah I think if you were really planning every millisecond they'd probably mm. end up being a uniformity to them which they don't have and is really nice it's like they're all quite free and moving yeah and then in like kind of later pieces um these pieces which are very new um I've involved the my collaborator at a much earlier stage, so in um, when they were made from paper mache, um, and we spent a lot of time kind of I spent time sort of imagining the sounds they might make as well before they start making them, 
it's like a second guessing in a way. Um, and because we started, well, that's, that's the performer, we kind of perform together and then we make notes and we talk about what happened um, in quite a lot of detail. Um, but so these are much more uh, kind of close to the body. Um, it's kind of a shield, a reflective or mask or, yep. Yeah, I was going to say there's like a an, an armour sort of present in them, which is, yeah. But uh, they're very flexible and very kind of um, uh, reflective. So I think in the stills, maybe it doesn't quite um, express the, the, the reflections. They're just constantly kind of moving and shifting and the shapes never kind of settle as well as the sounds. But this will be something I'll have... We'll like by the end of the year. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Ready Go to show. To it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is there anyone? Anyone got one? Oh, yeah. Thanks. Hiya. Um, I kind of got a question about um, like how this, I really like how the sound creates a sense of like a visual sense so because you can hear the material of the sound mm. um it kind of informs you visually where um and like so i guess my question is throughout like your just daily life do you kind of hear sounds and the material and then does that inform you of how to I'm kind of stuck on losing my train of thought. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, yeah, yeah. Sorry, go on. Like, the sounds you hear, does that inspire new work? Because mm. you're hearing the material of the sound, in a way. Yeah. Um, you know what? My, actually, my, uh, my partner is a field recordist. And um, so everywhere we go, um, we're recording often, um, well, that's not it's not me that's recording it's my partner so but i'm but i don't listen through the headphones and i'm not making the recording but i'm stopping um and i'm just kind of standing still and observing where i am and listening i don't feel i need to kind of build record where i'm at but i'm but it is definitely working this way has made me more sensitive to the sounds around me and um i think also I don't know if the word is synesthesia, because that would be visual and smell, or it's a kind of a, a it makes sense to me, this sort of sensory overlaps, of course, but um, I'd say it's kind of textural sound. It's like a, a, a feeling, it's very much, I, maybe that's why the touch is so important, because it's how it feels um, through your skin, the kind of n the knots of the strings that are being pulled through, that feels like a, a touch. That feels like um, it's kind of like yeah, um, hearing the texture of your surroundings, and then I suppose the using that knowledge to um, create these tools or sculptures or objects. Um, yeah, no, that's a really great question. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll probably wrap it up.